Hey, everybody. Well, we have quite an uh, accomplished speaker tonight. He's an avid mycologist with a BS and MS from Lamar University in Beaumont. His master's thesis was based on the study of East Texas mushrooms. Currently, he is a research associate at the Field Museum of Natural History in Chicago, where he has 5,000 of his fungi collections there. He also is a research associate at the Herbarium at Texas A&M, where he has 5,500 of his fungi collection. From 2006 to 2008, he was the fungi coordinator for mycologists for the Big Thicket National Preserve Taxonomy Diversity Inventory. He is past president of the Gulf States Mycological Society and has authored many papers related to mycology and discovered several new species of mushrooms. Four are named after him. He's a recipient of many, many awards, and you can see from his bio that include the North American Mycological Association Award, for, and he also has uh, an award about his Big Ticket Association, as well as uh, other contributions. He is also co-author Mushrooms of the Gulf Coast States, which I'm going to go buy, a field guide to Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi, and Alabama. So again, welcome, David, and look forward to seeing your talk. This is about the relationship between fungi and plants. And there's a quote I'd like to put up on the screen first. Soil is not just ground up rock. It is a living system, which includes, for instance, the mycorrhizal fungi, which play a very critical role in transporting nutrients from the soil into many trees. You go into some forest, you think the dominant plants are trees, but actually they're the mycorrhizae. If the mycorrhizae fungi died, the trees would disappear. But sadly, our understanding of soil ecosystems remain extremely poor. This was said by Parr Ehrlich in 83, and it's still fairly true today. Okay, let's go a little bit into some of the biology. First of all, of course, we, we know about plants. They have chlorophyll, they have vascular systems. They're reproduced by seeds and they're mostly fixed in place. Now, fungi now have their own kingdom because you know, back in 1969, they decided they were not really plants because they had differences. In this slide, this gives you an illustration of some of the, the morphological diversity of fungi. And what are mushrooms and fungi? Well, first of all, as I said, they, they don't have chlorophyll. They do not have a vascular system. <clears throat> they reproduce by spores instead of seeds. The so-called vegetative phase is composed of microscopic thread-like structures called a hyphae, and the mass is called a mycelium. And instead of being composed of cellulose, they're composed of chitin. And all of the mushroom is is the reproductive structure of the fungus organism. A few definitions. Mycology is a branch of science for fungi, or the study of fungi, and a mycologist is one having the knowledge of fungi. Just to give you an idea of how little we really know about fungi, this is a study done back in 91 by mycologists in England. Basically, he looked at the relationship or ratio of fungi to plants in England. And he came up with a ratio that for every plant, there are six species of fungi. So if you extrapolate this number, potentially there's one and a half million or more species of fungi in the world. So basically we know maybe 5%. And in Texas, the so-called higher fungi, we have about 1,400 species documented so far. Yeah, what do fungi do? Well, first of all, many are saprophytes, where they live off dead organic matter. Others are parasites, <clears throat> where they attack other organisms and kill them. And then we have the glass group, the mutualists, which form symbiotic relationships with other organisms, that is, lichens and mycorrhizae. And of course, I think everyone's familiar with lichens, especially uh, algae and fungus in combination. Now, the mycorrhiza is, is one that higher plants and certain species of fungi have. This slide sort of gives you an indication of the extent of mycelium in the soil. All the white material of this hyphae or mycelium, and you can look, it's attached to the rootlets of these pine seedlings. So this occurs fairly fast in the life cycle of a plant to get this mycorrhiza symbiosis. And finally, mycorrhizae is intimate and mutually beneficial symbiotic association between roots and fungi. 
and the mycorrhizals are thought to occur in over 90% of all families of higher plants. Finally, what are the benefits of the mycorrhizal fungi of the plants? Well, from this slide, you can see it does quite a few things. First of all, it uptakes, increases the uptake of water, phosphorus, nitrogen, and trace minerals. Sometimes they're associated with nitrogen fixing bacteria. Sometimes they help suppress plant diseases. They help free bound nutrients from dead organic matter. They detoxify soil. They stabilize soil from erosion. And the inoculated seedlings have a better survival rate than those that are non inoculated. And it reduces the need for excess use of fertilizer and pesticides. And basically, it helps link together forest communities and maintains biodiversity. And this is this sort of a gives you an indication of how important it is. The two seedlings on the right are, are inoculated or fertilized, and the one on the left is inoculated with mycorrhizal fungi. So it's fairly obvious that the plants do a lot better. Now, basically, we have two types of mycorrhiza, but uh, one of them has several subtypes. So basically, you have ectomycorrhiza and endomycorrhiza. But under the endo, you have ericoid, orchids, monotropic, and arbitroid. And we're going to those in a little bit more detail now. The ectomycorrhiza, this is between mostly gymnosperms, angiosperms, as the higher plants, and the fungi attacks are involved in Bucidios, Ascos, and Phycomycetes. This is the one most people are familiar with. This is the so-called fruiting body of the mushroom. In this uh, slide, you can see the mushroom is sort of forming a ring around the drip line of the tree. This is probably where the fine roots of the tree are in the soil. So the mycorrhizae form more or less near this area. And this schematic sort of gives you an illustration. Here we have the fruiting body fruiting, and the mycelium is in the soil, and it goes to the roots, or the, the small rootlets of the tree. And this shows in a little more detail. This is the actual physical aspect of the mycorrhiza. These are the swollen root tips. This is the actual point of, of interaction between the fungus and the tree. You can actually scrape the soil, look around, and you'll find these swollen root tips. And this is a, where the transfer of nutrients occurs. So here we go, here's another illustration. You can actually see the uh, swollen tips. And I think I have one more. And this one, you can actually see the mycelium in the soil that's been taken out. And you can see the um, swollen root tips right along here. So this is uh, pretty obvious once you start looking for the, uh, for the mycorrhizae in the soil. And the, uh, as I say, ecto, this fungal tissue does not you know, um, go into the tissue of the, of the root, it uh, forms a net around the ring, around the perimeter. And this is called the heart to the neck. And this is the uh, fungal mycelium uh, that surrounds the root, root tips. <clears throat> okay, a few things, a few illustrations of forest mycology, uh, of course, pine trees, conifers, or mycorrhiza. Uh, one of the most common ones with pine is one called Pinesolis tinctoria. We call it PT for short. It looks like a, it's a type of puffball, and it's really uh, one of the early uh, species that forms mycorrhizae with, with young trees. I just use it quite a lot, and uh, you can actually make this in culture and inoculate pine seedlings or other trees with it. Another one is the genus Amanita or Amanita. Uh, this is one called Amanita jacksonii, which we find with pines. And we have the Amanita muscaria, which we find with pines in the fall. Another one is Amanita rubescens, which bruises a red color. And now let's go on to Quercus, the, the uh, oaks. Uh, these are real diverse in Texas, uh, throughout the world, mainly Mexico and, and the Gulf states. And these have a tremendous amount of fungi with them. One species is in the genus Lactarius. This is Lactarius subpalustris, which has this latex. Another one is called Lactarius pecii, which is found with oaks in floodplain bottom and forest in the summer months. And finally, one of our favorites is the, the so-called chanterelles. These are highly esteemed edibles. This particular species, Cantharellus latericius, is really abundant in the summer times, and it's sometimes you can literally collect 
dozens and dozens of pounds of this mushroom in the oak uh, bottom and hardwood forest. Another group are the beliefs, which have pores instead of gills. And then we do have truffles down here. This is a species of truffle. It's actually undescribed. It's never been named. Okay. Now other trees, we have the beech trees and genus Fagus. Then we have the willows, genus Salix. Then we have birches, genus Beshula. Then we also have eucalyptus, which are of course from Australia, but they do form both ecto and mycorrhiza, which I'll go into more detail in a minute. Okay, now let's go into the, the endomycorrhiza. This is well, it's a little bit more complicated because it has a, a lot of more diversity and it's kind of a very confusing group to understand, but basically they have the host tax or bryophytes, pterophytes, gymnosperms, amulosperms, and sometimes the formal taxon is zygomycetes and also the cities also, and some ascos. And with the endo, this is a showing how it affects the sweet gum trees. Sweet gum trees are endomycorrhiza, not ectomycorrhiza. And a little bit more to define it, we have several types. We have the vascular, abuscular, or called so-called VA mycorrhizae. Then we have VAM or abuscular mycorrhiza. These have no mantle or no external evidence of the fungal hyphae around the roots because it goes into the cells. It's the really actually the most common type of mycorrhizal association. And the abuscal, they have branching hyphae within cortical cells. This is where this nutrient exchange takes place. And some have vesicles, which are inflated structures full of lipids. They affect about 300,000 species of vascular plants including woody, woody, herbaceous ferns, mosses, and liverworts. And it's present in all the habitats except aquatic. Now the fungi involved, we have the zygomycota, which have aseptic hyphae. Some have chlamydospores. And the spore of carps are really just spores that are quite, well, not too small. They're, they're in the millimeter range. It's about 150 species, an example is Gophus. And this is an image of some of the spores. As you can see, there's a wide variety of spores. These spores are obviously big enough to see with the unaided eye. And here's a blow up of some of the spores. And this is a schematic that shows how the mycorrhiza penetrates the cell, cells and goes into the interior of the roots and it forms vaccinations into the cell. It doesn't penetrate, but it forms these structures inside the cell, but it does not actually go into the protoplasm. And here you can see the musculars and the vesicles. And here's a uh, microscopic look at what it looks like. It's fairly obvious the differences. Now, let's go talk about some of the other, uh -oh, we have a little lightning here. Hope I don't get cut off. Okay, uh, we have the ericoid, which are the ericales. And usually we have ascos and some residuals associated with this type of uh, association. This is the ericoid, rhododendron is one example. Uh, these actually form coils within the root cells and other things involve, attacks involve the blueberries, cranberries. And most of these are the ascomycota, the ascomycetes. And here's a schematic that shows the fungal hyphae forming these coils in the outer cells of the plant tissue. Now, the uh, butoid ectoendomycorrhiza, because it's sort of a combination of both. And once again, it's in the same order, and you still have basidios and ascos. But this, the uh, mycorrhizal has a weak mantle, like the hearted neck, but it also has intracellular penetration. So it's sort of a, a combination of both worlds, the endo ecto mycorrhizal combined. And usually it affects mandrone and manzanita, which are Western species. This is not a very common type, obviously. Now, one of the more interesting ones are the uh, monotropoid. This is uh, the uh, monotropa uh, genus. And usually we have Bersidios, Bersidiomycetes, in the genus Russula, Lacteris, and Cerulis. And of course, here's, here's our. Uh, Indian pipe, the genus Monotropa. And 
Yeah, well, the monotropic is really fascinating because the plants are heterotropic or mixotropic. So they derive their carbon from the fungus partner. They, they don't have chlorophyll, so they have to have the fungus to get their nutrients. And this is something, consider actually a non-mutualistic parasitic type of mycorrhizal symbiosis. And then finally, we have the orchid mycorrhizae. And the plant replies on the fungus for nutrition. The fungus receives nothing in return. It's not mutualistic. So really the mycorrhizal term may not be appropriate since sometimes orchids are called microparasites. Sometimes these A chlorophyll, also we have A chlorophyllous plants. They also are referred to as saprophytes on the fungus. And the orchids are a large group, 30,000 species. 100 are fully mycoheterotropic. Others are initially mycoheterotropic. Of course, about 70% of orchids are epiphytes. And one thing that, because the seeds in the uh, orchid are so tiny, they require the fungus for germination. And the fungus actually remains until the photosynthetic leaves form or for life if the plant is achlorophyllous. And these are the structures that are formed in the orchid roots right here. They're kind of an odd looking assemblage of twisted looking strands of hyphae. And the fungi involved, uh, there's one genus, Rhizotonia. It's a pathogen, but maybe mycorrhiza. And of course, we have other ectomycorrhizal fungi related to the Afroalis. And then we have uh, some of the mushroom types in the genus Armillaria. And we have a few Ascomycota. And here's a so called honey mushroom, which is sometimes actually uh, is in, involved in the orchid mycorrhizae. Now, a little bit about the rhizosphere. This is the uh, area that surrounds root tips. This is where a lot of the uh, chemistry, the dynamics are, is going on. We have these nutrients, phosphorus, zinc, copper, ammonia, and so on, mang manganese, potassium, calcium, being taken up by the root tips. You have nitrogen chemistry going on over here and then other chemistry. So there's a lot of chemistry going on in this. Now a little bit about nutrient pathways. This uh, deals with the importance of fungi in recycling of nutrients. For example, phosphorus. Of course, phosphorus is real important in energy production by all organisms. So it's sort of a limiting factor because uh, you have to have it to have energy. And the cycle is pretty complicated. Uh, you can see in this diagram where sometimes it's been broken down, it's being excreted, it's in bones and so on. Different bacteria and fungi will dissolve it different fungi are involved in returning it to the plants. So once again, it's a, a lot of interesting things going on here. Of course, nitrogen is another important compound. Once again, then you have bacteria decaying the, the different types of nitrogen compounds, forming ammonia and nitrate and nit nitrites. And a lot of this is taken up by the fungi and retaken back to the plants for their nutritional value. A little bit about the uh, chemistry. Of course, we all know that trees produce, plants produce glucose. This is the molecule used for energy. What's interesting about the mycorrhizae, of course, the plant is taking the glucose and taking it, taking it back to the fungus because the fungus needs the, uh, for the most part, needs the uh, organic material to reproduce. What happens, the glucose goes down into the mycorrhizae and it's converted to a sugar called triolose. And once it makes this conversion to triolose, it's absorbed by the fungus, but it cannot be reabsorbed by the uh, tree. So it's sort of a sneaky way for the fungus to hold on to these carbon compounds. Now, actually, I've done a little work on mycorrhiza when I worked, in, I worked for Temple Inland for a number of years, and they uh, were interested in mycorrhiza on eucalyptus. They were growing eucalyptus down in Mexico. So one of the foresters asked me to come down and take a look at the uh, fungi on the, on the eucalyptus trees. So I went down there and they were growing these seedlings in, in nurseries. Then they would take them out and plant them in these, uh, fortunately they, they only planted them in uh, farmland that's already been used. So they were not cutting down any native forest to plant these things. And these eucalyptus in this photograph are one year old. So you said they grow quite fast. So I was interested in what mycorrhizal species are on the roots. 
So we started looking around. I did, we did some field work down there. Another example, these eucalyptus is about five years old. So you see they grow quite fast. Anyway, the forester and I, we were looking around and you look real close, there's these little puffball-like things on the base of this tree. This is one of the, in the genus Scleroderma. So this is once again, one of the early successional fungi on trees. And another one is in the genus Thalophora. This is a genus that's real common with pioneer and mycorrhizal with pine trees and so on. And finally, I was lucky to find some PT mycorrhiza. I found these uh, fruiting bodies and I, we took them back to the lab. And well, okay, let me, um, first of all, you can look in the soil, you can actually see the uh, PT mycorrhiza. It kind of has a yellow color to it. So it's quite easy to find once you scrape away the dirt. So once again, you see how extensive this material can become. Anyway, back in the lab, we took the PT and we screened it so I could get the spores away from the fruiting body. And I took some of this material back to Texas at the nursery. Where we planted these eucalyptus seedlings and I inoculated them with different amounts of the uh, Pisolethus tinctorius hyphae or spores to see what would happen. And generally in about six months, I had mycorrhiza form on the rootlets of the eucalyptus. So it's, uh, it's not too hard to do. It's really interesting. You can actually synthesize the mycorrhiza in the laboratory. In fact, that's sort of a key thing. If you can synthesize it, that shows that you actually have that association between that tree and that fungus. And that's sort of the uh, platinum standard to uh, prove that you do have a mycorrhiza between a certain fungus and a certain tree. Now, I thought I'd also talk a little bit about decomposers. The decomposers secrete enzymes to help break down organic matter because without their efforts, leaves, dead plants, wood, and so on would be piling up quite high. So just a few examples of some that you may see. You know, this is one I get a lot of calls about, especially in the summertime. This is the genus uh, chlorophyllium, and it forms these rings on lawns. And what this is doing is decomposing grass. So it's uh, you know, one of those things that's quite important in taking care of grass clippings. Another one that we find on lawns is in the genus Agaricus. These are, of course, uh, most people are familiar with this species because it's found in stores. Well, I should say the cultivated kind is found in stores, but we do have wild species that do grow on lawns throughout East Texas. And once again, it's one of the decomposers of black grass and other organic matter in the soil. Another one, now if you have a greenhouse, chances are you've seen this growing in your potted plants or on your mulch. This is the genus Luca caprinus. And of course, what do we have that decomposes uh, leaves and forest? And this is in the genus Marasmus. Uh, this is a real common on leaf litter in uh, East Texas. Once again, we have all this vast amount of wood from all, all our hurricanes. So what's going to decompose that? Generally within a few months of um, the wood being on the ground, you'll start, well, once it gets inoculated and it starts fruiting, you'll find the so-called turkey tail, which is the genus trimates. In which case, this is one of the first successional species on decaying wood. And another one, which I'm sure a lot of you have seen in the winter months is the one of the stink horns. This is real common on mulch and so on if you have mulch. So once again, be aware, these decomposers are also important in helping break down organic matter. Actually, I guess that's all I have. <laughs> so thank you all. And here's a few useful guides if you're interested in pursuing the identification of mushrooms. Thank you, David. Uh, we do have some questions. Okay. If David doesn't cover, I'd like to know more about how to improve soil to enhance fungi and also question about predatory fungi that feed on nematodes. Can you speak to those topics? Sure. Well, first of all, uh, you can get uh, inoculations of spores and things to inoculate your plants with. So you can actually get these things there in packages and put them with your plants and that would help, you know, encourage the plant to grow. And they one of the things is don't fertilize because fertilizer just is going to in inhibit the mycorrhizal fungi because the plant has the nutrients, they won't need the mycorrhizal fungi. So the best thing to do is try the mycorrhizal first and see if that works. And second question was about 
I'm sorry, repeat. Oh, on the other one, you, you can buy these at garden stores. Is that what you're recommending? I believe you can. I've seen them before. I, of course, I haven't checked in a while, but I'm sure you can. They have, I think, several brands that you can probably purchase. Now, I'm, not, I'm not a gardener, so I'm kind of in the market. <laughs> like yeah, I read about them being commercially available. So you can, so you think that's better than fertilizer? Oh, yeah, yeah. Try, try the mycorrhiza first, see if you can get it started. And the second question, I'm sorry. The second question was about predatory fungi that feed on nematodes. Okay, there's uh, several species. The one that uh, I'm most familiar with is the oyster mushroom, Floridus ostreatus. It actually has little hoops and snags that will ensnare nematodes to get nitrogen out of the uh, nematodes. Because you think about it, nitrogen is really, once again, a limiting uh, uh, element in nature because most of the nitrogen is is in the atmosphere, so it's got to be fixed. And once it's fixed, of course, it's going to be in a very dynamic situation. And of course, animals have a lot of protein because of nitrogen. So a lot of these fungi form these really interesting structures to ensnare nematodes and you know get their nitrogen from them. Another question is about yeast and the relationship of yeast that are flying through the air on plants and has this how does this interact with the fungi yeast oh goodness i don't know if i can answer that i mean there there are epiphytic fungi yes there's a lot of fungi that will grow on leaves and things like that in fact a lot of lichens will grow up on the canopy of forest and you know when it rains the nitrogen compounds formed by the lichens will rain down to the trees below so that's a interesting symbiosis going on right there as far as yeast of course yeast are everywhere I don't know. I don't know how it may. I'm sure if it gets into a pool of sugar, it starts fermenting the sugar. But as far as how it doesn't leave, I, I really don't know. Yeah, if it produces sugar, then the fungi can use the sugar. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. And we see mushrooms in our planting beds. Should we let them grow or knock them down? Let them grow. They're probably decomposers. They're helping decompose the, uh, if you have mulch, that, which is wood, you, you want that wood to be broken down so the nutrients can be released. And the fungi are doing the job for you. Just let them be. And there's no really parasitic fungi that I know that will grow on, on wood chips that would infect you. Well, of course, there's parasitic fungi, but for the most part, the saprophytic ones are going to help your mulch degrade, and that's what you want. Yeah, I have a question. A uh, person that lives in the central part of San, San Antonio and would like to inoculate, if that's what you call it, he says, yeah, in yeah. my garden uh, with the microsaur fungi to improve soil health. I noticed there are mushrooms growing in the trees in the nearby parks. Do you think this possible to gather those mushrooms and bring them to my garden to spread the spores? So what are your recommendations to facilitate oh, this process? Well, it would depend on species of fungi. I'd say without knowing what species evolved, you will have to, uh, I don't know. That's a good question. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I've, I've thrown mushrooms out in my yard, but they never fruit. So it's uh, usually once you get a, a population established in the soil, it's really hard for other fungi to get, get in there. But I would say if you have mulch piles and you see fungi fruit on the mulch piles, it's, Try to get the mulch and use that in your flower bed. You know, do a compost pile. So I think he's asking, can you take fungi from other places and put it into your own garden? And how would you do that? You can try. I mean, I once again, you, I'm not a, a gardener, so I'm, I mean, it probably would work if you had the right fungi. And once again, you'd have to have that right fungi, and that's gets a little more tricky because you have to know what what they are. Yeah, and do you go for the spores or do you try to pull the roots up and everything? Oh, I'd get the, uh, well, if, if you find some, yeah, I'm trying to get the, uh, pull them up and uh, probably some on wood might be, uh, well, I'd kind of be hesitant because some of the ones on wood could be pathogenic. Oh, some, good. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, some fungi will kill trees, so you have to really be careful about this. Yeah, yeah uh, we had that microlife fertilizer contains 11 strands of the fungi. I guess you knew that, right? Oh yeah, yeah. Some of them have several, yeah, several species in, in the uh, the inoculation material. Mm -hmm. Okay, Debbie, turn it over to you. 
Okay, I am interested in using fungi such as turkey tails to accelerate root decomposition rather than burn waste wood or fallen trees. Does anybody do that? Oh, I don't know. I don't see why it wouldn't work though. That or another one would be Pleurotus, the oyster mushroom. It's, it's a wood decay, de decomposer. Besides that, it also ensnares nematodes. So try the Pleurotus. And also you can eat it too. Our mulberry tree got killed by fungi. Should we just cut the tree down? Can it infect our other mulberry trees? If it's a uh, parasitic, it may well could. So I would, yeah, I would cut it down and dispose of it. Just be on the safe side. Okay, any more questions coming in? Okay, yes, I got one more. Okay, good. Any recommendations on how to get into fungal research as a student interested in bioremediation? Well, let me think. Um, my college courses are hard to find nowadays for some reason. It's like universities. Uh, I took mycology many years ago, and they don't teach mycology at these big, big universities around here, believe it or not. Now, A&M does have a, a Department of Plant Pathology, so that would probably be your best route because I, I, I know the professor over there and he gives the course in basic mycology for plant pathogenic fungi. So uh, you might try, try A&M. Um, other than that, I really, uh, I think University of Texas has some, but uh, I'm not sure how many, but I am familiar with A&M since I spent more time here. It's kind of sad that we don't, they don't teach basic botany and mycology anymore. Yes, those were two of my favorite classes when I was in school. <laughs> yeah, I know that too. And it's really ironic. I have another one here. Is there any soil additives that would be beneficial for fungi in soils? Oh, goodness. Uh, not that I know of. Yeah, I have a parallel question to that. Is a particular mushroom types that you recommend for improving the soil and gardens? Oh, goodness. <laughs> I told you that one was coming. <laughs> yeah. Boy, I, you, you got me on the spot. I can't, I, I would just say, do your compost pile and see what happens. Usually you'll get things on compost piles, fruiting. Uh, I've seen certain species that fruit on mulch and compost and just do that and use that. Cause that's, I mean, nature's taking care of it. So use what that she gives you. Well, we have next month is composting. So these two go together pretty well. Oh, wonderful. I should listen to that one. <laughs> yeah. Then I have another question. Do local truffles grow underground? Oh, do yeah, we, sure. Do we need pigs to go find our truffles? <laughs> well, there's there's truffles here with pecan trees. There's a tech, the uh, pecan truffle. Usually, I, it, I've only collected them one time. I found one one time. I haven't really tried that hard. But if you go out to the, the uh, drip line of the pecan tree, you kind of rake down about a, a half an inch, a half an inch, and feel for these little tubers. And do it in the fall. They seem to fruit in the fall months. And there's like little tubers. And try that. If you find some, let me know. Because they're here. And I have people send them to me. But I just haven't really. Most of my mushrooms I work with are above ground. But I mean, the, the truffles are, they're here. And there's a. Needs to be worked done on them, but I, I'm, my hands are full right now with other stuff. <laughs> well, um, I guess, you know, how many of the mushrooms are edible? Oh, every mushroom's edible once. <laughs> <laughs> the only thing is to know what you're eating. I mean, honest, I mean, there's all these wise sales. Don't rely. There, there's field guides out. Get with my college. There's groups. Of, I have mushroom walks in East Texas. There's a group in Austin, the Central Texas group, they're real active. So there's a lot of interest in uh, mushrooms right now. So join a group. Well, I joined a group back in the 70s and that's how I started learning about mushrooms. And I was fortunate to meet a lot of people that did this for a living and learned a lot from them. So just find somebody that knows what they're doing and hang out with them. 
Yeah, I went out with, I told you that I went out with one of those and they, uh, oh, it was so much fun. I found all these mushrooms and then we took them back home and cooked them with garlic and butter. They just taste so wonderful. I have another question. It's a beneficial fungi. I'd like to eat molasses and rock phosphate. Add it to your garden to encourage growth. It comes from one of our members. I have no idea. <laughs> well, she says it does it. You add molasses and rock phosphate. Oh, y'all. You know? She says you add it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, we'll, we'll take her at a word. I I really don't know. Well, I have a couple of questions on the edible mushrooms. Okay, I can help you there. <laughs> What's the best way to clean mushrooms that were foraged? They always have so many bugs. <laughs> well, that's a little extra protein. <laughs> Oh, no, if you find one that's really, really buggy and, and starting to decay, throw it away. Uh, you want, want fairly fresh mushrooms that are, a few bugs won't hurt because you, you cook it and that's just extra protein. But usually the chanterelles are fairly bug free and um, I, I recommend on chanterelles just cut them at the base so you don't have to pull them out of the ground because that way you don't get dirt all over the mushroom. And of course, the bolets are they're, they're, they can get pretty um, insect ridden. So you have to get those fairly fast. And some people recommend taking the tubes off. Now, you get into the other groups, the amanitas, you have to really, there's the most deadly mushroom and most delicable mushroom that are in the genus amanita down here. But the deadly one will kill you in about five days. So you have to really know the difference. And once again, uh, you, you, there's subtle differences between these species, and sometimes it takes a while to figure them out. And once you do it for a number of years, you become second nature. But there's certain groups like the puffballs, the uh, periciums, the tooth fungi, the uh, oyster mushrooms, puffballs, which are a really safe group. I promise you, I'll put more about edibility, but oh, oh well, this is what be about mycorrhizae. <laughs> Yep. So when is a good time to go looking for mushrooms? Start in May, about, about mid-May. The chanterelles, if the conditions are right, you'll start seeing chanterelles uh, about mid-May to end of May. June, July can be really good, depending on, of course, it depends on the rainfall, naturally. And we do have morels. Most, most of the morels are in March, mid-March. They're out in the hill country around Waco, Austin, and, and San Antonio. And they're probably they're having a sort of a dry period right now in Austin area. So I don't know how good there will be, but we do have morels in central Texas and there's some reports up in Northeast Texas also, but I've never ever seen them down around Houston. Um, have you ever experienced poison mushrooms? Nope. Good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm having a mushroom walk in probably in June in Newton County where I live, which is uh, north of Bowman about about an hour. So you're more than welcome to come once I figure the dates out. And yeah, it's not it, too far. Yeah. 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 And the chanterelles, if they're up, it's going to be, it'll be amazing. You'd be, you'd be uh, really surprised at the numbers you can find when they're really going. I have another question here. This particular person has a big pecan tree in his front yard and says, what pecan truffles are? They call pecan truffles. And I guess he wants to know if he can go find them. Well, yeah, certainly. They're good. Yeah, the, the scientific name is Tuber Lyonii, L-Y-O-N-I-I. But Google Texas uh, pecan, I mean, the, the pecan truffle, and they should be, uh, there's people in Georgia that actually harvest it. So it's supposed to be pretty good, they say. I've never, I've never have tried it, never have found enough. But I, I would wait till fall to look for it because it's, it's a, uh, basically it starts uh, forming the fruiting bodies in the late summer and early fall. So right now you wouldn't really find any. If we don't have any more questions, I guess we can say thank you to our speaker and thank you for attending. Mm -hmm.